welcome everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, brilliant to see so many people attending today's session. I'm Rebecca Gill, I'm the Executive Director of ROSA. And I am really delighted to be welcoming Jolie Brearley from Pregnant Then Screwed, who will be chairing the session, um, which is exploring how women's organisations are creating change and looking at the different ways um, that women and girls sector organisations do that across our country. We would love to hear from the attendees today, so please use the chat box to introduce yourself and to say a bit more about the work of your organisation. And also please use the Q&A box at the bottom to post any questions that you've got um, for the panellists. And then um, Joely will ask those questions in the second half, but obviously we may not have time for all the questions, um, depending on how many we get. Um, and it goes without saying that please be considerate to other attendees um, in the chat box and in the Q&A. The session is being recorded for public viewing um, at a later time, so it's not being live streamed. Um, and there will be a short comfort break halfway through, just so you know you can get up and get yourself a cup of tea. Um, so now I'll hand over to um, Jolie and look forward to hearing your chat and your questions. Hello, everybody. Thank you for that introduction, Rebecca. As Rebecca said, my name is Jolie Brearley. I am the founder of Pregnant Then Screwed, a charity which exists to end the motherhood penalty. Uh, we've been exist we've existed since 2015. A very small charity, but we do lots of work with um, mothers who don't have equal access to the labour market. And I'm Absolutely delighted to be joined today by Sonia Jalal from Hull Sisters, an organisation which promotes the independence and inclusion of all women from all backgrounds in Hull and East Riding. Halale Tahiri the, from the Middle Eastern Women and Society Organisation. They support Middle Eastern, North African and Asian women in London to rebuild their lives. They reject every form of discrimination, inequality and exclusion and inspire to a society where every woman lives in safety with equal opportunities. Emma Campbell from Alliance for Choice. Alliance for Choice believes everyone who needs an abortion should have free, safe and legal access in their own country without stigma. Janet Veach, who wears many hats, but today will be re representing the Women's Budget Group, an independent and not-for-profit membership network consisting of women's voluntary organisations, academics and policy experts whose aims are to promote a gender equal economy. Molin Delve from Phoebe, an Ipswich-based charity which supports BME women and children suffering from mental health, illness and domestic violence in the UK and Zimbabwe. So before these wonderful women tell us about their experience of campaigning and what they've learned, I just wanted to take a moment to reflect on the chaotic, intense, for some of us, traumatic 18 months we've all had since COVID-19 tore through our communities and threatened to set women's equality back by decades. Many of you watching and certainly the women on this panel have been on the front line working at the coalface, supporting women who are experiencing domestic violence, coercive control, poverty, threats to their health and their right to life, threats to bodily autonomy, their safety at work, their mental health and their income. It's been a difficult and challenging year and a half to say the least, and it's certainly not over yet. But this crisis presents an extraordinary opportunity as through magnifying the challenges that women face, it has exposed the systemic inequalities experienced by women, particularly disabled women, black Asian and ethnic minority women. With the impact of schools and childcare facilities closing, still being felt by mothers Months later, the government can no longer deny that it is women that do the lion's share of the unpaid labour, the labour that keeps society spinning and the care that is critical to a well-functioning society. With people trapped inside their home and some domestic violence charities seeing a 60% rise in calls to their helpline, the government can no longer pretend 
that all women are safe in their home. And with an estimated 31% of children living in poverty before the pandemic and experts predicting that that figure will, in, will have increased in the last 18 months, the government can no longer pretend that it's fine for mothers to not have equal access to the labor market. After all, children are not poor by themselves, they're poor because their mothers are poor. So I want to kick things off today with a message of hope. Okay. Uh, although things feel pretty bloody <clears throat> awful at the moment for many of us, as women's organizations, we can work together to trigger change because there's been no better time for us to make those arguments. And I know from my own work that women are livid at the moment. They are furious. They feel completely left behind in the government's planning and completely sidelined. And they're ready to do what it takes to ensure that their voice is listened to. And if we can channel the anger, then it becomes the perfect vehicle for social change. Firstly, I'd like to welcome Sonia Jalal from Hull Sisters. Sonia, could you tell us a bit about your campaigning journey? Where did it start? What steps did you take? And what have you learned? So, first of all, I would say that uh, I'll, I'll start, like you say, the inequality and discrimination, physical, sexual, and psychological stereotypes of all women begin at their birth. Women face these challenges from the start of their life. The whole global structure is patriarchal and it's patriarchal societies who decide in making behavior women in the society. So women always cope to struggle or struggle against patriarchal norms in the structure of society make it conducive for them to live on. Unfortunately, the condition of black and minoritized women organization like us is not different than the condition of black and minoritized women in our society because the whole structure is male dominant and their attitude towards women issues are so insensitive. They want to see women in defined roles, black and minoritized organization like us struggling on a regular basis to bring or create the condition of changes in society, influence the policy of government uh, for equal rights. I'll limit myself to black and minoritized women organizations. I am uh, one of the founder of Whole Sister. Whole Sister, uh, dealing with women from all background, suffering human rights abuses, empower them, make them independent to stand up for their own rights and to take control of their own lives and bodies. The struggle of BAM organization like us is not only for our clients' human right abuses, the, the human right abuses like discrimination, violence, uh, racism, antisocial behavior, they face on daily basis, um, but also a struggle for ourselves, for our survival and independence. And these two, uh, you know, experiences, they interlinked or blind in us in a very beautiful bond, you know? So for example, racism and discrimination or blind face from institution or in individual capacity, we're facing that on organizational level. So I, based on our personal experience, I can say that when you support these victims of women and make them aware of their rights, and, and, and boost up their confidence and their morale. They surprise you in return. They will not only fight for their own human rights, they will also stand by you side by side in an overall campaign uh, and struggle for equal rights, which they, they done with us. They've been, uh, they've been in forefront of our campaign since October, 2020. We've been elected in October, 2020 by our landlord. We've been told that because of pandemic, they cannot accommodate a larger group like us, and that we should consult the whole city council for further support. So we had a few meetings with the leader of the council, and we explained explain our situation to the leader of the council. The leader of the council said that 
He promised that he will not only support us in accommodation for long term, but he will also provide us funding and he will ask all the services why uh, they are not treating black and ethnic minority women organization like this fairly and treating other organization very fairly. We were very, very happy. We explained that we never received any funding from Hull City Council in the last 10 years. So uh, we were very hopeful. We say we have achieved our goals, but it didn't happen. Uh, we received a call next day. We've been told that the building is only available for four to six months, it is for sale. And soon the private buyer come, we will be asked to leave. So we, will, we, we said, where will we go? Uh, what kind of a building it would be? We'll just be just be in and then out. So uh, anyway, we explained that other organization, newly set up organization have been given building for free. Why this discrimination is with this? So we've been told that the other, other organization have strong links with Hull City Council and that we don't have. And if we want to have a building for longer term, we have to pay 30,000 pound a year to them. We were in a very difficult situation at that time. But if we agree to pay 30,000, it will disturb all our activities and will badly affect our client groups. And if we refuse and have no building, then it will increase pressure on board members. And all the deliveries, central equipment, food parcel, everything will come to our homes. So it was very hard choice for us, we had to make. And we come to hard decision and chose our client first, thought that their needs should be met first. So we shifted everything to our homes to make, which made you know, things very much complicated for us. We started as an outreach service, our little army of staff and volunteers, they started going door to door to help and support our women service users and their families. Our social media staff was asking donation from public and organization for sanitary items for food during all this pandemic time. And you've got a crowdfunder, haven't you, Sonia? You're doing a yes. Crowdfunder. We have GoFundMe link, so we started our GoFundMe campaign and ask public uh, to donate us generous, generously for so that we buy our own building. That is the only way to become independent. Yeah. Um, so. In this way, we be, we've been able to overcome some of the miseries of our service users. So we dealt 500, more than 500 women and girls in five months. Mm. Because all of them, they were desperate, you know, for food, for sanitary items, for everything. And there was no support available in the area for black and minoritized women, particularly. On personal level, two of my reception room, kitchen, one bedroom occupied by organizational stuff, on lighter mode, I ordered sofa set for my TV lounge in last September 2020, but there, there was no space in my reception room to accommodate it. The furniture people kept asking me uh, for delivery, and I, I've been just making different excuses. But and they finally they sold the sofa set to somebody else. But they prom they promised me they'll order some you know some for me once I'm ready for it. Um, initially, we hired a cafe. And we kept all our food items, sewing machines, printers, everything in the cafe. But it'd been welcomed. So the drug user, they stolen all our sewing machines. And so we, we had to pay 75 pound to the cafe landlord as well because uh, for broken window. So we had to move everything to our own homes. So you can see my home is just my house is full of stuff. I'm sorry to interrupt. We're going to have to, just because we've only got five minutes each to get through everybody, but I'm sure lots of people have questions for you in the second session about what's what's happened. And thank you very much for that. Um, Halala Tahiri from the Middle Eastern Women and Society Network, if I could come to you now. Can you tell us a bit about your campaigning experience, please? Thank you, Julie. Uh, I had a little presentation, if it's possible, that I can show it. Is that, uh, is that okay? Or otherwise, have you got it? Yes, I'll do that now. Hang on. Well, actually, would... while you are doing that, uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to talk. 
uh, among the, all those um, uh, member in this meeting. And uh, uh, it's a good opportunity actually to thank you, Rosa Foundation, for one of our campaign, Polygamy Matters, that they the first start, it was actually Rosa Foundation helped us with that. I'm Halal Tahiri, executive and founder of Middle Eastern Women and Society Organization. And uh, as uh, Julie um, uh, presented our organization, we reject all form of um, um, discrimination. And then uh, we are, our value is on a secularism, on justice, and uh, we wanted to uh, help uh, uh, all uh, women in London. But during COVID-19, I must say that because it was enormous numbers of uh, uh, women who were under pressure, especially migrant women uh, from uh, even out of London, we supported them as well. We have, uh, apart from uh, advice and uh, uh, some legal support uh, and health and well-being workshops and holistic support, we have four campaigns that I am interested in the uh, interested to introduce it to you. If you go to the second page. Um, please. So we, uh, by the sensitivity of those campaigns, I'm just uh, uh, starting with ban virginity test, ban virginity, uh, ban hymenoplasty as well. Uh, and then polygamy matters, which is really important. Step up migrant women is a coalition, more than 50, 50 organization in Pan London that we are working together to support migrant women, to support, to change and demand uh, um, uh, sorry, amend the domestic violence bill uh, in order to support migrant women. And also we have LGBTQ plus matters campaign because um, it's a very, very sensitive issue in uh, our community. We really wanted to help our uh, young generation. Could you please go to second, third, next? Yeah, but actually, um, in ban virginity test is quite uh, popular. It's very quickly starting in the community. Uh, we started two years ago in this uh, campaign, but uh, the other organization shows interest. Uh, the government shows interest. We are aware that in uh, France, uh, they changed the law for bank virginity certificate. And now the government is interested after the work we all have done that to ban virginity test. You might be very surprised that I tell you that this happening in the UK, uh, up to 300 pounds each which girls or their family must pay for the uh, testing the virginity. And then for hymen repair surgery, which some of the girls are doing that because um, they are worried about their virginity or maybe they had some relationship before marriage. So it's up to 4,000 pounds they will pay for the underground clinics, private clinics, which is very, very dangerous uh, journey, uh, very, very traumatic. Uh, and bring it a lot of anxiety for those young girls. And many of them, if they don't um, uh, require such a virginity in the community in the night of wedding, uh, we have cases that have been killed, that have been abandoned from the family, from the community, that have been beaten, that have been sent to uh, family uh, again. And it's uh, so traumatic and uh, as you know, I'm sure that you know that health, uh, World Health um, Organization as well say that this is a violation of human rights and it should be banned. So therefore, um, suddenly even government find out that this is important. Women organization are just giving the cases of those women have been uh, subjected for such an issue. And that's a uh, huge in certain communities. So therefore we needed to uh, do something. Yesterday we were in a round table uh, with uh, MPs, uh, Lord of uh, Common, House of Common, and uh, uh, Home Office as well, member of them, three organization with some uh, lawyers. We were determined to encourage the government as they are speeding up for ban virginity tests, it's really important that they should ban hymenoplasty surgery, which they are going to divide it, which is totally wrong, which is totally dangerous. My worry that I express in the meeting say that if you don't ban hymenoplasty, 
it will be another problem because we girls, without knowing whether they are virgin or not, they are going and rushing, going to the underground, paying so much money, painful uh, journey, just fixing, stick up without knowing really if they are virgin or not. So therefore both of them should be banned. Hopefully they, in the meeting, they looked like um, they are happy with our argument. And then they found us very like a strong alliance, three organization and all lawyers. So we are hoping that uh, it will be banned both of them. Uh, if you go to the second page, so when it will be banning, so it will be a law and legislation uh, could you, yes, and then, but uh, this is not enough by the law. So what is important is the education. Education in the community is crucial, it's so important. Um, you, you can't just um, criminalize, um, victimize all the parents and say that um, you, are, you will be fine uh, if you are doing that, but you must educate them. And educate the young generation as well, because just in this week, I meet a client who have done virginity test, and I ask her to tell about the story. So she talk and talk and talk. And the painful part for me was that when she were talking about this process, she didn't know that she was a victim of virginity fraud. She, she, she really believed in, in virginity. And then even, uh, so, so that's, a, that's a huge in our community. We all know that more than 40% of women have no, not bleeding in the night of the first experience of sexual life. So by the definition of those community, they are not virgin, but this virginity is just from, it's just a myth. And then it's it not, um, uh, reflect to everyone by bleeding. So therefore, uh, and prevention is really important. Those young girls who are in dangerous situation like that, having relationship before marriage, or they don't want it to go for hymen repair. So they will be in danger by the family, by the community. So we need support for those women. So we all discuss it in the meeting. Hopefully we are waiting for end of July uh, that they are announcing um, the process of being the law and the process of how they can help us. But I'm going to tell you about the second one very quickly. Uh, just you, we're over time. Can you give us, can you give us a really quick, I know you want to talk about this polygamy campaign as well. I'm so sorry about that. I want to just to compare. In this no, there's so much to say, so many brilliant things to say. Yes. Um, if you could well, actually, talk. yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if you are aware about that. More than 20,000 women in uh, UK are on a polygamy uh, relation, leaving polygamy relationship. And we have a big project with the Greenwich University to ha help 100 women, uh, um, women to be independent, to be strong, to be empowered, to choose for their life they wanted and then to work on the community to change this attitude as well. Uh, so I wanted to say that this polygamy matter starting with Rosa Foundation who supported us. Now the funders are interested and all happening all under the COVID-19 because it's too much in those family that is happening. The good thing is that in both campaign that we started, there is a lot of energy, there is a lot of passion among the women, among the pioneer women in the community. And hopefully for the first campaign as well, we needed more alliance. And the second campaign as well, we needed more people to help us. It's really important that if anybody is interested to changing such an attitude in our community, please contact me. Uh, I would be happy. I'm sure that uh, each of you, if you think about such an issue, uh, will be helpful in this process. Thank you so much. Thank you, Helen. Thank you very much. Um, can I now come to Emma Campbell from Alliance for Choice, please? Can you tell us a bit about your campaigning experience? Thanks, Emma. Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Good, I'm just going to present here. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, up until October 2019, Northern Ireland essentially banned most uh, forms of abortion. Um, and so uh, over a thousand uh, women and pregnant people a year travelled to England to access services there, which were which they also had to pay for privately, despite us paying into the NHS. 
Um, and around the same number of people would order um, the safe but illegal pills online and a number of people had been uh, prosecuted uh, and gone to court for accessing those pills. So um, there's only five minutes so I don't want to go into like some big long boring legal explanation but essentially we should have had the access and the right to an abortion in Northern Ireland from uh, the regulations came in at the end of April 2020 which as we all know was also the same time that uh, COVID really um, blasted off in uh, Ireland and the United Kingdom. Um, so uh, we not just we don't just address the legal framework, but we also address the um, stigma around abortion. I know there's an awful lot of people here from uh, organisations that support uh, mothers and parents and 61% of people who access abortions are already the parent of at least one child so we very much view this as something where people are making a responsible decision about whether or not they can be parents at the time. Um, and we really really have pushed for this that it needs to be legal to be safe. What happened um, when Covid started was that the Northern Ireland office were on Twitter telling women and pregnant people in Northern Ireland that they could get a, travel to England. It's totally fine, we'll pay for your services when you get to England in the height of the pandemic. So they were still telling people that they had to travel. And what was happening very often was people were booking flights um, and the flights being cancelled the day before their appointment. Um, and what, en what ended up is the only way to access an abortion for people in Northern Ireland at the start of COVID was an eight hour each way freight ferry where they were traveling in lorry cabins um, and essentially because of the way the pills work miscarrying on the way home on that freight ferry uh, which is obviously completely disgraceful. Um, on, the on the other hand uh, COVID uh, meant it kind of gave us an opportunity so previously, when people were accessing the pills online, they were at risk of life imprisonment. And as I said, um, uh, people had been arrested for that before. And uh, people in Alliance for Choice had had their homes and studios raided and posts intercepted and so forth by the police. Um, uh, just a little summary here of the, I mean, I say differences, they're really convergent. So the views on abortion across uh, the three different jurisdictions is more or less in alignment. Um, but uh, when the regulations fell, or when the regulations were laid, suddenly it was no longer illegal to access the pills online. So the online providers aren't statutory providers in the UK and Ireland, they're actually an NGO based in the Netherlands. But you go through an online consultation with a doctor and then the doctor sends you the, um, the pills on prescription. So what we ended up becoming <laughs> uh, in, in a much more extreme way than we ever were before, we did this work before, but um, much more spread out and ad hoc, was we ended up becoming people's abortion doulas. So uh, we would direct people to these sites, we would get them to take the pills, we would train uh, community activists and our own members on um, the medicines, how to use the medicines, the safety of them, uh, when people might be in danger, what symptoms to look out for, and so forth. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm sure, like most of the rest of the UK and Ireland, our sex education in schools is pretty appalling. So the idea that anybody would have been touching on abortion pills and what they do in school education was laughable. But even in a community um, framework, they're really not talked about, even in uh, contexts where it's completely legal, like the UK. So we really felt that um, we knew that the majority of people supported the right to choose, but do they know the ins and outs and the safety, and do they know, um, you know if their friend comes to them, or a sister, or a daughter, or um, a partner, do they know what to do um, when they're ordering the pills? Uh, so the, the decrim means Northern Ireland currently has the best law in... You've got about 30 seconds left. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. The best law in all of Europe, um, but the access because of the DUP, who've been blocking and won't commission anything, means... Hang on, we're on the last slide. Uh, <laughs> that, the, that there's still a huge problem with access. There's a problem with clinics who are pretending they're abortion clinics and not abortion clinics and getting people through their doors and, and purposely delaying treatment. 
Um, and so when we talk a bit uh, later in the q and I'll talk about how, if you want, you can support our actions in Northern Ireland. Thank you. Thank you for being concise at the end there as well. That was really interesting. Uh, so next, can I come to Janet Beach, please, uh, from the Women's Bridget Group. Um, thank you very much for setting this up. It's a great opportunity for hearing what everyone is doing. Um, you said at the beginning, Jolie, that I'm here for the Women's Budget Group, but I might, if I get a 30 seconds at the end, also talk about the Happy Baby Community, which I'm also involved with, which uh, provides drop-in centres for refugee and asylum-seeking mothers um, in London. So this is all about how we create change. Um, and the Women's Budget Group is a little bit different from uh, a lot of organizations in the women's movement because what we're trying to do is uh, look at the economics of all this. Um, and I wanted to uh, look at a particular example where this has been done over like a 20 year period more, um, which is violence against women and girls and making thinking about what the economic case is for investing in ending violence. Um, and obviously we would do this anyway, even if there weren't an economic case, but uh, often in the women's movement, we're doing work which is based on values and saying this is what the government must do. Um, and they ought to do it for moral reasons. And that's absolutely true. One of the things we try and do is build the case for investing so that government sees that they will in fact save money down the line by ending violence. Um, and we do this for everything. We're trying to think of what the economic impact of their policies is. One of the things government, I would say, often does is treats economics and the economy as a gender-free zone where they just don't have to think about this because we're often not in that space. What the Women's Budget Group does, which I think is one of the most valuable things, is brings together feminist economists and activists into the same space so that we can share the research that's going on and we can see what the, what the economic impact of women's inequality is. And just taking the example of violence against women and girls, um, probably oof, 20 years ago now, one of our members, Sylvia Walby, uh, was commissioned to start costing violence, to see how much it costs us as a country, the cost to individual women, the cost to the state as well, you know, how much does the criminal justice system cost? How much is it to rehouse women? How much does it cost to run refuges and rape crisis centers? And she started putting all these costs together, the cost to the health service, the costs of, you know, when you can't go to work, when you're sick, when you're going to the hospital, what are the, what are the lost, in, what's the lost income look like? And she added it all up and her initial figure was about 23 billion a year, which is a lot of money, even in government terms. And as a result, we were able to go to the government and say, this is what it's costing you. So if you were to invest instead in prevention work and in protecting women, this is the money you would be able to save theoretically. Um, so it's, a, it's making the economic case to support all the other campaigning work that everyone is doing. And that's essentially what we try and do. Um, so we try and work in partnership with women's organizations um, so, for example, we worked, uh, we've done a lot of work with Runnymede, where we've looked at the cost of an austerity programme and particularly looked at the intersectional impact. So we've, uh, what we've done is an analysis of who suffers and who pays out most, what the impact is on women from different ethnicities and in different types of households. And we were able to demonstrate that over the 10 years that we've had austerity programs, you know where you cut taxes, but you also cut public services. But the people who pay for that um, are the women in the most disadvantaged communities and the most disadvantaged areas. So minoritized women 
um, and particularly single parent women um, were the ones who were paying most because they lost the most in public services um, and in cuts to benefits, cuts to universal credit. Um, Just on time, you've got about 30, 40 seconds left and I know you wanted to talk about the Happy Baby Community. Oh, yes, I did. Um, so Happy Baby Community, um, one of the things that we've found over COVID is that putting all our services online, so we didn't have drop-in centres anymore, obviously, actually in some ways was a benefit to creating the change that we want, which is empowering uh, women to run the organization themselves. So it's a buy and for organization, but also economic empowerment. And what we now do is we give women the um, connectivity. So they've got mobile phones, and that gives them a lot of advantages. They're not only able to join our online meetings because we've given them that connectivity, um, but they're also able to connect in other ways. You can imagine doing without a mobile phone, especially when you're in a strange country, you might have only just arrived. This is really important for them, but we find it really difficult to get funders to see the importance of that and to fund it. Um, but an economic autom autonomy, as we all know, is deeply connected to your vulnerability to violence, to maybe being re-trafficked, as a lot of these women have already experienced trafficking. Um, yes, I could go on. Yeah. But maybe we will in the questions discussion. Yeah, Thank absolutely you. For everybody. I'm delighted to introduce Molly Dell now from Phoebe. Over to you, Molly. Um, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'll just uh, put my timer on, sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, thank you. My name is Molin Delf. I'm founder of uh, Phoebe, uh, an Ipswich registered charity in Suffolk, specialist organization. Um, we support uh, black and minoritized women and girls uh, struggling and fleeing domestic violence. Uh, and we've been in operation since 2008. So we've been around for quite a while. And so when we uh, was, I was uh, asked to be part of the conference, uh, we, I was looking at the um, topic, um, how women's organizations are creating change. So I put that into the context, how black women's organizations are creating change in Britain. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> I wanted my whole talk, I think, because of the time limit, I know, uh, I, you know, might have to cut this short at some point, but I would like to, to uh, have the listeners focus on uh, the intersecting difficulties that women face. We want to, I want us to focus on intersectionality, the meaning of it within the lives of uh, Black and minoritized women and girls that we work with. Uh, because that's the whole uh, essence of our work and the whole essence of the campaign, the work that we're trying to do, uh, you know, within Suffolk. Uh, and also, obviously, as a contribution to the whole movement, you know, uh, in, in, in the country. Uh, so we really feel that uh, as an organization, we want to bring up, you know, how the intersecting uh, difficulties, the historical disadvantages that women have faced and have experienced are continuing to follow them. Uh, in you know in their lives in their everyday lives so that's that's basically uh, what our organization stands for at the, this present moment and all services that we are bringing uh, to them uh, that's what we hope to sort of you know uh, give others who may not have come across you know migrant women who who have been trafficked uh, into the UK and may not know or understand. Uh, the experiences that these women actually are facing. So sometimes it's very difficult uh, for, for, for people, for everybody to understand this. So I just quickly, you know, thought, well, how are uh, Black uh, women's organizations, you know, creating change, contributing to change? Uh, and as a result, focusing on Phoebe, uh, Phoebe stands for Promotion of Health, Opportunity, Equality, uh, benevolence and empowerment of uh, uh, black and minoritized women. That's the acronym uh, that we sort of work towards. Um, and so um, 
just wanted to say that, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to say that our services, I'll just list our services and then try and uh, again put them into the context of this is what we're trying to, to um, you know, to uh, challenge uh, and to support women in. Uh, so we, we uh, have recently, since COVID, uh, been funded to um, support uh, Black and minoritized women and mothers and babies. So I think we all know that uh, black mothers and babies are at risk and high risk, uh, you know, of actual death <laughs> during pregnancy and their disadvantage. And so we have a support uh, group now where we're sort of uh, working directly with um, uh, NHS and the perinatal, uh, you know, teams uh, so that they can understand where these women are coming from, uh, the differences that they bring and the, and the needs that they have, which are different from other women and from the white women and the other women. So we, we, we are working with, with that, that team. Uh, our main work has been in domestic violence, uh, domestic abuse of migrant uh, women. And, uh, and, and I will say again, our work has been uh, led and shaped by South of Black Sisters, Imkan, Rights of Women. So those are the women who have really supported us to shape and understand systems, and we've moved forward with them. And so our work, again, we are looking at uh, helping professionals, social workers, nurses, doctors, psychiatrists, uh, to understand that when a woman comes and she has fled violence and she's, she has insecure immigration status, there are lots of layers that she and hoops that she has to jump and just trying to understand her and the needs that she brings. And for example, many women do not report to the police from her own country, many of the countries that the women come from, they will not report to the police. They will not be listened to. Uh, I think um, Sonia has mentioned the fact that it's a patriarchal system globally. And so especially from countries like ourselves, you know, where really, um, you know, there's just impunity, <laughs> impunity. there's just no, uh, you know, support and help. And if, if um, uh, a woman is, is, is attacked, sometimes she, she, she's actually, you know, not supported at all uh, by the police or, or the systems. So she won't have uh, trust in, in um, you know, the authorities. And so understanding that, you know, uh, the mainstream organizations can understand why it is that she may not be able to, you know, to report to the police. Uh, and so we are also working, we, we, we know that language is a huge barrier, obviously, for, this, for these women to seek support or and to, uh, and to, and to um, you know, be offered support. And so um, we, we offer uh, language classes for the women. Uh, we offer girls self-esteem, preventative work, girls self-esteem in schools, uh, and sexual violence uh, awareness. And a huge, huge part of our work during COVID has been welfare support, you know, uh, giving and uh, helping women to access just basic food banks and getting the uh, basic sort of uh, local authority welfare system, uh, schemes, you know, benefiting from those. Women have been afraid to sort of, um, you know, go, go forward. And so because of the existing, you know, intersecting difficulties that our women face and that are not always understood, women will just, you know, fall away and fall out of the system and will not receive support and will be invisible. And so we're trying to help uh, those who are support and, and help uh, and hold the purse to speak, to understand that uh, our women bring, for, bring with them a lot of difficulties, a lot of uh, discriminative sort of uh, practices which they have experienced, racism, um, you know, uh, the religions that they belong to sometimes will bring them down and will hold them down. Uh, so we, that's what we want our work to focus on, you know, moving forward, really bringing out, you know, those hidden difficulties that people do not understand and that our women are facing uh, at this time. It says seven minutes on my watch. I can carry on. I haven't been stopped. <laughs> But listening to you myself so I thought everybody else would absolutely feel the same um but yeah we were, we are gonna have to stop because we're eating into the comfort break so um yeah, yeah. Back, if, uh, if you want to let everybody know what time you should be back are we still gonna have a comfort break or I think so that's what I mean we've got time for it so that's what you'd prefer then we should do that yeah 
Okay, so if everybody comes back in five minutes, goes and gets a cup of tea, has a wee, all of that stuff, and we'll come back with question and answers. If you could pop your question in the question and answer box as well, have a think over the next five minutes what you'd like to ask our eminent panel. Thank you.
People ready to start again in one minute? Yes. Wait for Mullen. We've so far had three questions in the um, Q and A box. Um, if anybody else um, wants to ask some questions, do put it into the box, and if we have time, we will um, answer them. Three very good questions, though. So I, I will kick things off if everybody's ready to go we're just waiting for emma actually aren't we great there we go uh so first question is to sonia as i know hull councillors are labor and should therefore have helped hull sisters with their problems could you tell us sonia what labor have have done for hull sisters so far <sighs> It's, um, it's very sad um, to say that none of the Labour Council has done anything for us. We had few video conferences with MP Diana Johnson, who also sent an email to the council and asked for migrant women funding. And the council sent a letter say that they don't have any strategy for BAME women or BAME strategy. And still, they didn't give us building. And and then actually the, 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 we approached to labor councillors, but none of them, they just help in any way or any shape, nobody. Uh, in fact, one of, during pandemic time, one of our wonderful national news, um, it came in from her Daily Mail into Daily Mirror and Daily Mail. Uh, she was a wonderful woman, a UN refugee from Syria. And she was living in a damp accommodation where she had 12 different types of illnesses, including kidney uh, infection, liver infection, hernia, rheumatism, asthma. And she was living in a very, very extreme damp uh, house. And then uh, when her story went viral, people posted racist comments, as we all know that any BAME story come, we just receive racist comments. All the people posted the comment that she should go back to own country if she's not happy in her. So uh, we were, that time our campaign was against racism and discrimination because we've been evicted and we were still, you know, on campaign. Um, so one of the counselors, she posted um, on her Facebook um, that we are the one who are inciting newspaper and triggering racism. Uh, their counselor also supported and in support they posted comments. And that has given a very, 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 very insensitive message to BAME women that BAME women are all alone in there and they should not uh, raise their voice for anything, you know, if they face. So hearing that some of the community organization, mostly councilor, council, like benefited from the council, uh, they also put uh, some comments on our Facebook and blame the victim rather than supporting her and the miseries she's going through, but no, nothing happened. And it was just all victim blaming and us and all this. Now, we don't know what will happen. Uh, council promised that they will do BAME women strategy and uh, funding allocation and things like that. We don't know when will happen, but, but we are still you know, campaigning. And this is the sad bit. Uh, yeah, no, nobody helped. We've got photographs on the screen of the work that you've been doing at Hull Sisters during the pandemic. Do you want to say anything about the photos? Mm, this is my kitchen. <laughs> it's all full of uh, all stuff. So my bedroom and also the reception rooms, all of them, they are just full of this. I don't have any space, just a bed somewhere. <laughs> And all of this stuff, just waiting if, you know, a miracle happened and we get a center and all these 485 women and girls could move there with all this stuff. So at the moment, my, my house is working as a center for all these women. 
You're, yeah, you're doing incredible work, Sonia. Thank you. Um, you can find Hull Sisters on Twitter. Somebody's added as well to the chat uh, at Hull Sisters and on Facebook as well, I think. Um, Halale, a question for you. You spoke of advocating for law and policy changes to support your cause. Where did you learn those skills and who are your allies in government? It's a great question. Oh, you're on mute. Uh, yes, uh, well, my background is social work as a professional and uh, uh, I'm starting working with the women, vulnerable women in the community. So I am a community leader and I'm a practice leader. Uh, not the one that I, I have done either with Rosa Foundation, amazing fellowship leadership program, which I manage it and it was wonderful. I've learned the new skills about that. But to be honest, I in the community, I'm famous because I, I don't, I'm not scared. And I'm always talking about my passion, about my opinion, and I'm uh, looking after my women and girls in the community, whether other alliance, other group in the community may not uh, agree with me. Uh, and I always open the um, uh, space for negotiation together, working together. Regarding this issue, when we were there, our alliance was the Karma Nirvana from Asian uh, communities that they have a huge, uh, the same issue like our Middle Eastern and North African group. And then ICRO in London, we were three organization and Dr. Charlotte and the two lawyers from those organization. So all were professional and working in the community. And then that was enough for the government to hear from such a amazing group that they are working in the community. And then we have stories, we have evidence, we are connected with the community. And if they wanted to change it, anything in the community by the law, so they need us because we are bridges between community and the government. And we already are engaged there. Yes. How have you, um, which MPs have you gone through? Which, which yeah, one? So Richard Holden is an independent uh, MP that uh, bringing the bill to the government, uh, to the House of Common. And then uh, he is liaising with all the organization uh, that we are working together. So um, the last, last month, we had a big conference actually started from that. It was a huge conference. You may, some of you might be in the conference because we were focused on the virginity test. We invited from French side as well to learn from their experiences. We invited House of uh, Common uh, members, uh, Richard as well, Limko Ali, who is related to the FGM and women organization, Karma, ICRO. And we uh, bring you the witnesses that we are talking about themselves. And you can't believe it that witnesses from all the generation as well talking about the experiences, the painful experiences. And the reflection of this conference was huge. Still, I could see that in yesterday when we had a meeting, they just related the discussion in the conference again and again when we were talking about the education for the community, when we were talking about that uh, we needed support from the government when we started with this law. We, we discussed it in the last part, how we are going to work with the challenges in the community, because the law is coming, people doesn't understand it, those people who we really are, we needed to help them. And then who will help those people to understand such a thing? Otherwise the reaction will be very quiet. Um, uh, dramatic uh, because they think that they have been victimized uh, and then the government they, they starting to react uh, and then there is some attitude in the community whether by religious leaders whether by those people who always produce the customs from their background in the community they don't like this such a changes uh, and then we are against their law uh, somehow we are against the uh, against the the religion 
some part of them. And by the way, it's happening a lot in Muslims community, but we, we, we would like to say that this is for all communities because somehow it happened in other communities as well. So those challenge, we needed to be strong alliance with the support from the government, with the support from everyone yeah. as well. Thank you, Halali. Um, lots of questions coming through now. Um, uh, Helen would like to say thank you to everybody for their contributions. Uh, a bit like speed dating, as I'm sure you all have so much more you could share. The work that all of you are doing is vital. She's interested in the financial cost of what we do and how much we contribute to society that is not valued, the cost of childcare, the amount of unpaid elder care and the loss of income through abuse. Really, women are not valued in society. We're totally taken for granted. Um, so the question is about, so so much energy is spent fighting for our rights and fighting to dispel the myths about virginity rape and shock, shocking about polygamy. Governments are not about creating a fair and equal society and so much of their energy is about ticking a box. So getting a financial figure on the work women do is valuable and we also need to contribute networking and sharing of our campaigns. How important are men in our campaigning and how do we or should we engage with them? I'm going to come to Emma for this question, see what your thoughts are about engaging men in the work that you do. Uh, well, firstly, I would say that we're inclusive in terms of we would also be fighting for the reproductive rights of trans men and non-binary people. So first of all, um, second of all, uh, quite often men are in the families that are directly impacted by a restriction on abortion or uh, a lack of the full spectrum of care in pregnancy. Um, however, we uh, want to foreground the people who've had direct experience um, and we, uh, you know, especially Northern Ireland, even more so than in Great Britain, our political landscape is dominated by men and there are one or two parties that do quite well here, Sinn Féin uh, and the Green Party and Alliance are good for uh, women and other genders apart from cis men who represent in the parties but the likes of the DUP and other unionist parties are really atrocious um, and so absolutely then embedded in the political system is a complete misunderstanding of the needs and wants of women and our families. Um, our childcare is the most expensive outside London and we don't have the 30 hours free that exists in the rest of um, GB. Um, we are still, I guess, languaging under uh, some fundamentalist evangelical and fundamentalist Catholic ideals in certain quarters of the community. Um, and that, you know, that demonstrates itself in um, our really high figures for domestic violence. And we have the dubious honour of being joint first along with Romania for um, intimate partner murder in Europe. Uh, we have the highest use of weapons and domestic violence in Europe and so forth as a result of the conflict. Um, so we do include men as allies and we include them as people that will support us, but we do not um, give men the space to lead on any of the decisions or any of the forming of what we're asking for. Uh, the majority, not all, but the majority of decision makers, so councillors, MPs, MLAs, uh, legal drafters um, that we work with are women. Um, but, it, you know, we don't actively exclude men, but they are never going to be part of our, of our own internal decision making or campaigning processes. However, there are spaces where allies and men who support us can be a useful voice. Uh, like in our um, pro-choice and faith project or uh, maybe in the higher echelons of the health service just because there are so few women in the upper strata of lo lots of our institutions so um, what we need is, isn't always reflected. Uh, we did do a video that was uh, about how men can be allies and there was an interview uh, talking heads of lots of different men talked about why they support um, a woman's right to choose but one of the questions we get asked a lot 
uh, by, you know, the usual devil's advocate is what about um, the man being able to make a decision about the pregnancy or ending the pregnancy? And our response is always, in an ideal situation, someone will be in an equal partnership with their male partner, and they would talk about it and come to the decision together, but it completely ignores non-consent, it completely ignores pregnancy as a result of rape or sexual violence, it completely ignores um, uh, uh, you know, interpersonal abuse, it completely ignores religious doctrine or uh, people's beliefs where the man is the head of the family, etc. Um, so I think un until we're at a point where we know that we are definitely equal and will always be equal in any decision-making process, then we cannot give men the, um, any part in that decision. Halali, could I ask you the same question? Uh, for what about? What role do you think uh, men could play in your campaign? Oh, yeah, about that, I, I was interested to actually answer. Yes, it's really, really important. Although in uh, our communi community, it will be more challenging because the structures of our community is so much man dominated. It has been supported by the customs, by some religion, by, by religion definitely, and those cultures that it, it, there is. And then those value, those value who is in the wider society, it doesn't exist in certain community, in our community, unfortunately. And you can't believe it if I tell you that sometimes I feel it when I'm going dealing with the cases of divorce, and I must contact, you know, Musk or about it because there is a lot of nikah marriage, unregistered marriage. You can't believe it that how much is challenging deal with the Sharia law, for example. And I feel it that I live in a, a society that there is two tier of government or ruling, ru ruling the communities. Because one is the Sharia law running, for example, in the community, it most um, related to the religion and man structured and women has no right in such a situation. It's, the struggle is very, very crucial and we feel very uh, frustrated sometimes with working with such an issue. And then one is the British law that we must uh, try and try all the time that to connect and um, discuss it with the family, with the mother, with the woman who is in trouble, to helping, let, helping women to be led by the British law rather than Islamic law, especially when it's coming to custody of children, heritage, uh, divorce, separation, and then uh, some, and especially in the polygamous relationship, you can't um, triple size. I say 20,000 women are registered, but triple size of that is unregistered. How? They are going to mosque for nikah marriage. And then when they are in trouble, like a domestic violence, like a neglect, like a financial neglect, and they are coming for help, the social services doesn't understand the connection of that. The police doesn't understand that. We understand that. And then we are involved in such a situation. And then they are going back to the divorce, if it will be by Sharia law, so the woman lose everything. Right now, I'm working with a case of women crying every day, calling me that, uh, sh sh can you come to, for example, we are planning to do that uh, as soon as possible. It's a three years I'm struggling with my husband to give me divorce. Uh, he doesn't give me Islamic divorce. It happening in right in London, not in Saudi Arabia, not in Iran that I came from. And then, because, because when she goes to Musk, say that if your husband doesn't give you divorce, so you have no right to ask for that. This is the two-tier law in this country, unfortunately. So therefore, uh, our alliance as a man is really, really crucial for us. And we rely on young generation. Young generation who have been educated at school, out the community, at school about the value of human being, about the value of equality for women and girls. And then 
we, uh, maybe this generation will help us. Otherwise, the other, the older generation have been brainwashed, have been doctrined, many of them. I'm not saying that all of them, but it's a quite sensitive and big problem for us. But of course, like any part of the society, we can't just rely on a women's power. We needed both sides for change. Yes. Lovely. Thank you, Halali. Um, unless anybody else has um, something they really want to say on that topic, I'm going to move on to a question for Janet. Is anybody? Sonia, Mullen? No. Okay. Um, Janet, a question from Avril for the Women's Budget Group. What are the top three to five issues that you're currently working on? Mm, okay. Um, so, uh, in the last couple of years, we've run a commission on a gender equal economy, where we brought a lot of experts and women's organizations together to look at what a gender equal economy would actually mean. Um, and we went all over, you know, uh, the UK, talking to women in Northern Ireland, in Wales, Scotland and England. And the big message was the care economy which I think a number of people have raised today, the importance of the unpaid caring work that women do and how the whole economy really relies on that um, and how that can be recognized. So that's a big piece of work. You'll find much more about that on our website if you're interested in it. And then the second thing, which is a bit more relevant to what we're talking about today is a thing called the Local Data Project. And that is a project that's designed to support local women's organizations to access information, data about women's inequality in their particular area. Um, so we've created a web page that shows you all the local data and we're running free workshops. This is a bit of an advert, free workshops on how to access that data, how to use it, to build your case. So for example, if we think about the, um, some of the campaigns we've heard about today, uh, maybe the Hull uh, campaign, if you look at our website, you'll be able to see information that you could use, which would help build your case for the local authority investing in the work that you're doing. Um, so those are kind of two things. Um, and can I take advantage of just for 30 seconds, to address the question that Effie put about um, what, what is the government, are local authorities and central government taking this into account when they're funding us? You know, the knowledge that we're all doing this work for nothing. I think this was the next question down maybe on the Q&A. Yeah, yeah. And I want to say, yes, exactly. That's exactly what's happening. All the multinationals, are bidding for contracts to deliver services for women and taking that away from women's organizations, particularly minoritized women's organizations. Um, and I would really love to see Rosa bringing all our voices together and creating a campaign around this. That's all. Sorry to hijack that question. Don't, don't be sorry at all. That was a great point. Thank you very much. Um, can I come to Mullen now? Question from Annie Gibbs, who wants to know how the we, as a listening to you, um, can go about better advocating for Black women who experience domestic abuse. Uh, I'm just, I'm just, I think it's particularly care experienced. I think it's care, um, Black women who have got experience with the care system seems to be the question. Ah, okay, the care system. All right, thank you. Uh, black women who've ex who have experienced being in the care system. All right, it's helpful then with social work as well, <laughs> by training. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, it, it, the, I think uh, black women who've experienced the care system might have uh, had an adverse experience, um, as you can imagine. It's sometimes very difficult. I think I, I can remember a case I had uh, some some uh, black girls who were put into foster care, um, and um, luckily for them, they had 
grandparents, their mother was um, a sex worker. So they lucky for them, they had grandparents who, who could understand, uh, who, were, who were willing to help and support and look after them. But these, these, these uh, girls, um, social workers then, I wasn't their social worker, but I, I was supporting other social workers. They didn't understand the, the cultural sort of makeup of the family and they wouldn't place uh, these children with, uh, with um, their grandparents. And so I was able to intervene and actually I encourage the, the, the other social worker to place these girls with their grandfather. So, so you'd find that uh, I think uh, black women who've experienced um, the care system and if they are now adults, I think really just being uh, uh, willing and able to, to seek um, you know, that um, therapeutic support you know, in peer support. I think I think the, the most powerful way of really getting over and getting through that experience, if it was if it was, if it was not uh, positive, is engaging in a program where you can have peer support, people who've lived the experience that you've lived and who can help you walk with you, talk through those experiences that are similar but different and be able to support each other through life, uh, you know, using the uh, sort of, um, uh, therapeutic systems, not in the sort of strictest sense, but, um, you know, real life uh, walking together. I feel and I've noticed that uh, uh, that really has uh, can help uh, women sort of peer support, peer to peer support. Uh, and just being able to, you know, engage with uh, more positive services, even volunteering can really help and empower you. Sometimes, uh, you know, the care system can really strip you you know, of independence, you know, it depended on the social media, it depended on uh, placements that, you know, you have varied placements within your, your lifespan, sometimes 20, you know. Uh, so it's a really difficult uh, space depending on your experience. And I feel uh, being able to sort of grasp, uh, grab back your life and, and uh, engage with services, other women's services, where you can get peer support, where you can engage in, in positive uh, therapeutic uh, activities, where you can give back to others and that can build you as a human being and as a, as a woman and can empower you to, to, to you know, help others as well. I feel that can be a starting point. And I know that also they need to be very um, patient. You know, I think having been to a, a, a system which really stripped you, stripped you of your confidence sometimes, you will need many more years of building up your confidence, building up your, your self-esteem. So being patient with yourself, that might be something that could work. And also understanding that people are different, individuals, individuals are different. And so just, just getting a good therapist, getting somebody who's um, able to sort of um, support you and also using non-conventional uh, non sort of ways of coping. For example, if you have faith, you know, take that on, you know, and, and use that and, and build your strength on that, you know. So family, if you still have family who you can rebuild relationships with, those you can. So not, you sort of um, really cheap and cheerful ways of um, uh, you know, uh, getting back onto your feet. Thank you. Thanks, Maya. Um, Sonia, a question from anonymous attendee. Who is supporting you <laughs> with all of this? You're obviously taking on a lot with what you're doing with Whole Sisters. Who is supporting you, and um, who is supporting you as a, from an organisation? But I guess the question is larger than that as well. You know, how do you not burn yourself out? How who is supporting you? Um. Okay, we were completely alone. It was the time. Nobody was supporting us, except Black and Minority Organization in Hull. It was Rosa and Women Equality Party who always, always supported us till today. And Small Wood Trust, they also supported us. But in our campaign, um, we have like now made good links with national and local organizations and persuade them, you know, just to support us. But Overall, um, nobody in Hull, no white organization have supported us. Um, in fact, white women organization, um, they even didn't bother to ask why we have been displaced, displaced and why the media are publishing stories almost every second day about us. Uh, so nobody came to support us. That's, that is very, very upsetting, you know, I feel black and minoritized women issues are not white women issues. 
we are different and our issues are different and they don't think that it's their issue. They think it like they don't think that it's their issue. They think it's your issues, you deal with it. So yeah, the support was very, very minimal and especially at all level, just the black and minoritized organization, they all come together and they made a report to the city council about racism and discrimination they are facing from the council in the services. But that has been refused as well. That give us the evidence of racism. They didn't accept it. Although the evidences were there, the case studies of the organization were there, but you know, um, nothing happened. We just like found support from national level organization who are more aware and they just wanted to support. So yeah, in our campaign, we were quite just quite alone, no support. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. Um, just a reminder, everybody, that Whole Sisters do have a crowdfunder if you'd like to contribute to the crowdfunder. Um, uh, another question from somebody anonymous. Um, and I'll, Halali, if you could take this one, please. Many here today are doing campaigning work within communities which can actively oppose women's equality, rights, and freedom to make choices about their lives. How can we most effectively campaign to change people's minds and create more supportive and understanding communities? Are you happy to take that question? Yes, of course. Well, actually, um, one of the, um, um, I, I don't say that maybe good things in the COVID uh, pandemic uh, period, we all learned and we had the opportunity to exercise it, it was solidarity and it was campaigning. So people shocked by the COVID-19, but the solidarity from people and the voice of people raised because everybody was in a, their isolated cell and then we still needed to communicate with each other. One of the things that increased dramatically and very good, it was campaigning. During the COVID-19, people starting or organization or activists starting campaigning together. And the reaction from other people was very active and we all are engaged. We are like a, a very, very connected all together. I would never in during 11 years that I am working with this organization until this one and a half year be connected with so many network, so many campaign and so many hours that I spend or other people spend it with me to helping through the campaigning. So the campaigning have been a model, a good model to raising voices of the community, of the people, which is really, really good. And then for the communities, especially for those people who are most vulnerable, uh, we are aware about that, that the status, the status government they don't want to spend money of them, of the changes of such a thing. They always wanted that um, get rid of some sp uh, spending money. That's why in the recession cut uh, benefit, benefit cuts starting. So it's the same with the community. When there is a problem, so it's the only voices that can remind the government that there is enough problem in the community and you must help otherwise it will collapse. It's a women organization, it's us, it's on our shoulder. And how we can make noise about that, it's a campaigning. We make campaign, we make noise about that, we ask for alliance, we ask for people to come and join us when we are bigger, stronger voices. So of course we will be heard by the decision make makers, by those people who can help in this change. But the law, the government and the money is not enough for the changes in the community because we are aware as i said that other bad side other attitude other customs who are very painful harmful for women children for most vulnerable vulnerable people like lgbt group for refugee people who have no benefit at all there is other harmful issue that affect those people and it's just produced in the community. So therefore education as well is really important. Raising awareness is really important. And who will deliver that? 
It's a women organization. It's a, those people who are already connected. It's a pioneer women and pioneer people who a uh, community accept them as a member of themselves. And then they must show their role and then they must start in working uh, with the community. And then we must make it, uh, trying to find it, um, you know, more people that is the same, is the same level like you and then wanted to change it. And then liaise with the other part who doesn't want to change the situation, who might be uh, reject your um, work or everything. So it's a long process, but it's happening. You remember that uh, every change is starting from the bottom. You can't just change it by the law. You will fail if you just, uh, by law starting, but you don't have people behind you. These people must be educated, must be ready to accept it, then the law will work. Brilliant, Halali, absolutely brilliant. Can we, we're really running out of time, we're almost at the end. So really quickly, if everyone could just say, and if you can be really concise, that would be amazing. Just one thing you wish you had known before you'd started campaigning that you know now. One message of something, if for somebody starting campaigning, what, you, what you'd like to pass on. Um, Emma's nodding her head, so she's obviously thought of something. So I'm going to come to you first, Emma. Uh, politicians don't know anything more than you do. Um, we, all, we all poo, you know, so... We all are starting from the same basis and don't let them pretend that they do either. Brilliant. Janet? Um, I think the thing that I've learned over the years is the importance of coming together to talk, particularly about issues that we find really divisive and difficult to talk about. And that's, in a way, the value, I would say, of second tier organisations, particularly like Rosa, that you've got that convening power where you're bringing women together and we can talk about anything and we can develop solutions for anything as long as we're able to talk. Great, brilliant, thank you. Marlon? Uh, something positive. I, uh, I think there's hope when we speak to um, our primary school girls and boys and we just ask them questions that are so knowledgeable and, and uh, they are such powerful, you know, advocates uh, for positive change in society. So uh, I feel there's hope and that we should start at uh, primary school at, you know, reception uh, school as well. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I feel our community is divided. And so the women are divided in black and white. Um, because we are experiencing all these things. So based on my experience, I would say, we need to have a very good network, like Janet said. And somebody like Rosa should bring us all together on one platform so that we know we understand each other's miseries, understand each other's problems, and support each other. And then we can influence our decision on all levels once we are together. If we are not together, you know, we are divided. How can we influence? We I feel white women have never understood our issues and they never taken our issues as their issues. If they have taken, we would have been able to brought equality for all women long ago. That's that's my my experience. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Anya. Halale? Women's resilience is really, really important. It shows in the COVID-19. And then don't as in the underestimate this resilience. Women's power is really, really important in the change. So if we really wanted to change, our women must be ready, must come. Otherwise, nobody give their power and the right to them. You must take it, the right. So this is really important for me. The right is taken, not given to anyone, especially to women. That is a great note to end on, I think. So thank you everybody for spending your sunny afternoon listening to this talk. I think it's been brilliant. So I'm sure everybody else does. I'll hand you over to Rebecca. 
Oh, thank you so much, Jolie, and thank you to all the panellists. But that was brilliant chairing, Jolie. You really um, do bring such a brilliant energy to campaigning. And um, on that note, um, what would you? What would be the one thing that you would bring, Jolie, if you'd known at the beginning of campaigning? Can't push the question back on me. Um, I mean, collaboration. I have really, really learned that collaboration is absolutely critical to making change happen. So it would be all about collaborating really well with other organisations. That is brilliant. Thank you so much. And um, that, on that note, I can remind you all that at 4pm, the networking sessions will open. So do join in and you can find some fantastic women from around the country who are doing brilliant um, work that you can collaborate with, network with and uh, do some more campaigning with. So thank you so much for, for coming and um, thank you panellists. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming and listening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.